My name is Bill Baker. I'm here uh, to interview Dr. Jack Cronenwood. As you well know, the SVS has sponsored a series of interviews with past presidents of the society and uh, really very famous vascular surgeons. All of us can just read the curriculum vitae and find out where they were born and what papers they wrote and et cetera. But it's the purpose of these interviews to give the, uh, uh, the listener a sense of history and to allow the listener to hopefully get to know the uh, person being interviewed so that they become real human beings, not just remote academic vascular surgeons. Today we're privileged to uh, interview Dr. Jack Cronenwood. He's an unbelievably accomplished human being who has risen to the top of vascular surgery for a good cause. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to this interview, not only because he's such a, a wonderful vascular surgeon, but he's also a good friend. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Bill. And uh, thanks uh, to you and, and to Jimmy Yao for putting this program together. I told Jimmy this morning that it's, uh, it's going to be very interesting to look back on this in future years, and it's really great that you're doing this before we forget everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's before or not, but we'll give it a shot. <laughs> Now, you were born in Ludington, Michigan, a uh, relatively small town up in, a, up in the still lower peninsula, but northern. How was it growing up in Ludington? What kind of a family did you come mm. from? Well, I came from a, a working class family. My father was a, a machinist, a detailed machinist. My mother was a secretary. Uh, it was a tourist town. It was a beautiful town to grow up in. Uh, we lived on the, uh, it was on the lake. We never lived on the lake. Uh, my father was an avid fisherman interesting story is that he had a small trolling motor. He never owned a boat, but he was a great fisherman and so friends with boats were always inviting him to come and bring his motor and go out and fish with him. <laughs> <laughs> and so I grew up doing some fishing and hunting with my father. Uh, and I always thought that uh, Ludington would be a great place to live if it just had a college. Probably true. Brothers and sisters? I have one sister who still lives there and uh, is a, a ER nurse. Well, they must have obviously emphasized medicine somehow. They did, although there was no history of medicine in the family. And in fact, my, growing up, my mother would uh, suggest subtly uh, <laughs> that I think about a career in medicine. And I always replied that I had no interest in medicine. And in fact, from the age of 12, I knew I would be an electrical engineer. Hmm. And I only uh, interviewed at uh, MIT and Caltech, and Michigan Tech and Michigan for undergrad and for financial reasons and other reasons ended up going to University of Michigan to be an electrical engineer. And after a year in engineering school I realized that I enjoyed the discipline but interestingly the people who were in engineering weren't my typical friends. And uh, so I broadened my perspectives a bit, transferred into LSNA if you will. I went into a variety of different things. Then after that, I, I at one point it was in a math major, and I was a biology major, and I was um, ended up one summer. I'd spent a summer going back home work with Dow Chemical because I was so into science, mm -hmm. and, and they were had a plant in Ludington. And then uh, the next summer, I saw a little. I was going up an elevator in one of the buildings, and I saw a sign uh, wanted a research assistant for the summer, and it was in a physiological psychology lab. And I um, met this wonderful guy who um, sort of turned me loose in, the, in this small room in the up attic of a little building on the University of Michigan campus where I had my little rat lab and did all these things that summer. And uh, as a result of that, I became uh, a psych major. And I ended up with a degree in psychology. And the following summer, I, I switched labs and worked with a, another sort of neurophysiologist who was a neurologist. And he persuaded me, that was between my junior and senior year, not to go to grad school, but to go to medical school so that I could do these experiments on people. <laughs> <laughs> and so my senior year of college, I was taking organic chemistry and the various prerequisites to get into medical school. And I interviewed that year in places like Stanford, and they would ask me, why do you want to be a doctor? And I said, I don't want to be a doctor at all. I just want to do research on people. <laughs> <laughs> and Stanford was kind enough to take me. And so I had no intention of ever going into medicine or really even practicing medicine. And when I went to medical school, I was uh, quite sure that I would be in the psychology, neurology area and doing research. 
first summer in uh, medical school, I did psychology research going all around the Bay Area interviewing acute schizophrenics. We were trying to differentiate signal from noise, and there was a lot of, it was very interesting, needless to say. <laughs> Particularly in San Francisco. <laughs> yes, it was. And it was an eye-opener for me. <laughs> but, um, the, and then the second summer, right before um, we started our clinical rotations, I went back to Ludington and did an externship with the, all the surgeons, or physicians, I mean, in this small community hospital. And my goal was to spend time in their offices and get my introduction to clinical medicine. And the other interesting thing was at Stanford, everyone was interested in medicine and no one was interested in surgery. And so there was a lottery system. Everybody asked for surgery first so that they could have their medicine rotation last and get the best recommendation. I did the same thing and I was, had a low number and so I was scheduled for surgery in the fall of my third year. So I go to Ludington. And I meet a, a fellow named uh, Rudolf Castellani, who was a classic general surgeon, trained at what was then Detroit Receiving Hospital. Uh, was the, would have been the prototype for the book, The Making of a Surgeon, could do anything, and was head and shoulders in intellect and ability above any other person there. It took me about a week to figure that out. And then I spent the rest of the summer with him, sort of following him around, uh, doing all of these little things. And uh, one day we were, he was in the operating room. We were doing, a, he was draining an infected Bartolin cyst. And uh, we were down at the end of the table. She, of course, was in stirrups and anesthetized. And there's this big uh, presenting abscess. And he handed me the knife to make an incision. I had seen him and helped him, assist, first assisted him on a number of cases. And he handed me the knife. And uh, he, uh, I made the incision. And I gave it back to him. And honest to God, he said to me, well, Jack, it's kind of like sex, isn't it? The first time you try it, you know you like it. <laughs> a true story. <laughs> so I go back to Stanford, having had this thrilling experience with him in surgery, onto a surgery rotation with uh, Harry Overhelman and John Wilson, two classic mm -hmm. uh, general surgeons. And there was a chief resident, an intern, and me. That was the structure of the service. And after one week on the service, the uh, intern was pulled because the intern in the emergency room developed hepatitis. Mm -hmm. So it was the chief resident and me on this service. And they had a lot of Crohn's disease patients and difficult mm -hmm. patients. And so I would go around and make rounds and make rounds of the attendings and I, I pretty much carried a, a, the PDR around with me because I knew all these things but I had no idea what the name, the generic, the brand names of the drugs were and the nurses were very kind and, and I just had this phenomenal experience uh, and I was taking call as a medical student for the service in the house every other night. And then the chief resident had scheduled a week vacation during this time. And so Overhelm and Wilson said, well, we're not going to do any elective surgery and everything. And so, Chief Resident, so it was just me making rounds with Overhelm at one point in the day and Wilson at another point in the day for their patients. But as you know, luck would have it, several emergency cases came in that week. And so I got to go to the operating room and assist Harry Overhelm on these redo Crohn's cases. And um, the funniest thing was that some months later, I finally get tracked down by it because he, the first case we do together, he said at the end of the case, as an attending would say, Jack, would you like to dictate this? As in, Jack, you will dictate this. And I said, yes, sir. And of course, I had to find the dictation room because I had never dictated a thing in my life. And I can just imagine how this note would sound if I read it today. Well, we took a knife and we made this huge incision and then we, all this pus came out and we, you know, it was, uh, and months later the transcription team tracked me down to sign this because they had no idea who I was or what I had done. And so it was, um, it was a wonderful uh, maturing experience and it was all downhill after that. And I knew when I finished that rotation, uh, uh, having spent that summer, that I was I was a surgeon, and I never looked back. Great story. All right, so you went through Stanford, and you'd been hooked on surgery. Uh, did you do any other rotations besides uh, Dr. Oberhelman's uh, service? Well, interestingly, um, at that time, I really focused. I had had quite a bit of experience in that summer, and so I spent my time focusing on. Uh, medical subspecialties mm -hmm. that I knew I would need in surgery. So cardiology, infectious disease, nephrology, radiology, I did all of those rotations. 
And at that time, even as a medical student, we were putting in central lines and putting in A lines and doing the things that you do just on a normal rotation. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, like a 12 week rotation in surgery. So That's super. it was great. So, so then you returned to Michigan. I did. I, I did, and uh, it was a great training program. I had, um, I, I just, I'd momentarily forgotten that I went there in my fourth year to do an externship or, mm -hmm. uh, at Michigan. Okay. Uh, and so I spent a month there working with the faculty and the chief residents, and I thought they were phenomenal, which is why I then ranked them first. And, um, and I was not disappointed. Um, it was a great rotation, I mean, a great residency. The only difficulty was that there were um, seven going to be, I think, seven chief residents, but when we got there, we realized that there were 14 categorical residents in our internship here. <laughs> so um, it was a pretty steep pyramid, and at the end of two years, um, I think one person had left, but six people uh, had to find other positions, and, and they were good people. It, it was not the best system. Um, one never knew why, you know, one mm -hmm. person was selected over another, and I think we have a lot better system now. but. Uh, it was a great, um, it was a great training program, and I. Uh, it t tradition was to go into the lab, you know, after your second year, and uh, spend a year in the lab as a general rule. And I, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in general surgery. I looked around, talked to residents, and uh, was highly recommended to go into Marty Lindenauer's lab. Uh, Marty was a great gentleman, and he and his tradition was to really give the residents their head and let them do what they wanted to do and always be available but never get in their way. And that appealed to me. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I uh, spent a year in the lab and then actually spent an extra, added a year to my training, spent another, another six months in the lab and did a little more clinical. And during that, because he was a vascular surgeon, I became, I went to all the vascular uh, uh, weekly conferences and went to the journal clubs and really, uh, my first exposure to Jim Stanley really was in the journal clubs and, and I was amazed with uh, his command of the literature and uh, that was a, uh, you know, Jerry Zelenock and Mac Whitehouse and I were all in this internship year together, all ended up going into vascular surgery and, and we were all in the lab, at different labs, but at the same time and we would spend hours going to the library and, and we would load up these um, metal carts with the, uh, the bound textbooks because we wanted to Xerox a copy and the only Xerox machine was back that we could use was back in the surgery department and one day we were rolling back and forth with these gurneys and Bill Kuhn who was a, a famous mm -hmm. Michigan surgeon came by and as Bill would do that you guys ever write one tenth of what you wheel back and forth you'll be amazing <laughs> 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 and I, I chuckle now sometimes because I think that current trainees who have and, and, and us, who now have just immediate access to electronic media mm -hmm. uh, from any location, uh, don't appreciate, in, in some ways, how difficult and time-consuming it was uh, then. And when I uh, b joined the faculty, by the time I moved to Dartmouth, I think I had maybe five file cabinets full of reprints, mm -hmm. all filed and categorized that, that I learned uh, sort of from Jim Stanley at Michigan, and it was invaluable. And the funniest thing is that it's been hard for me to let go of them. I keep saying, well, if I don't look at any of them this year, I'll get rid of them. And then I say, well, but I might need that one file, so I'll wait another year. Well, I still have them. <laughs> and I rarely have to use them. It's called progress. That's right. Right. So when you went into Marty's lab, uh, he directed you towards uh, sympathectomy and blood, skin blood flow and muscle blood flow? Well, there, there had been some interesting work going on using microspheres yes. to, to measure blood flow and where it was going, and I had ideas about that, and we had some, you know, theories about it, and, I, and uh, it was sort of set up in the lab, and so I carried that on, and we branched out a little bit to use microspheres to look at, uh, you know, like, intrarenal distribution of blood flow during sepsis and other uh, sort of hemodynamic mm -hmm. experiments, most of them using dogs, um, and it was uh, it was a good learning experience because it was um, you know we had, we had a lot of good mentorship and we had a lot of independence. Wonderful. So then you uh, finished your residency, yes, and did a fellowship in Tennessee. I did I? Uh, I had had a, a lot of uh, good you know um, research experience at Michigan. And I really wanted to spend a year, it was, it was only a one-year 
training right. program then. And I really wanted to spend a year with somebody who was considered an outstanding technical surgeon. Not that the people at Michigan weren't, but I wanted to see it from a different perspective. And I thought I had had enough uh, research experience. So I chose that for that reason. And of course, Dr. Garrett was uh, an amazing uh, technician, uh, amazing gentleman, an amazing clinician. And he had a wonderful manner with patients, you know. And, and uh, so I went down there, and it, it was interesting because uh, at that time in Michigan, uh, no one wore magnifying loops. Bill Fry had been there um, during my training, and it was considered somewhat, I think, unmanly to wear loops. <laughs> and uh, I, I went to uh, Memphis, and, and uh, Dr. Garrett, coming out of the, uh, the uh, Texas tradition, the DeBakey tradition, always wore magnification. And um, so I. They immediately got me some loops, and um, and then they taught me other little tricks. Like you know, I remember one day operating with Dr. Garrett at Michigan. We were always taught to palm a needle holder. Mm -hmm. That was a faster way to sew. And uh, and uh, he saw me probably the first day doing that, and he said, uh, Jack, do you know why they have the holes in the end of those needle holders? <laughs> <laughs> he said, Let me show you this. He said, Now. It's okay to palm that needle holder if you don't care where that needle comes out, but if you care where it comes out, you might want to try putting your fingers in those holes. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. Uh, and uh, we had made, always made transverse incisions at Michigan. We started making vertical abdominal incisions in Memphis. And so there were a lot of things that I learned there that were different from what I had done in Michigan. And uh, it gave me an opportunity to kind of pick and choose uh, I then went, after that year, as you know, went back to Michigan to join the faculty, and I raised some eyebrows, I think, uh, that first year when I wore loops and started making vertical incisions, some of which I did just to be different, uh, recognizing that you can make many incisions and be successful. But it was fun to do things in a different way and show the residents there were more than one way to do things. Well, a good surgical personality that likes to butt against things. Isn't it? <laughs> That's right. That's so right. you spent, then you were there on the faculty for four years. Right. Mostly at the VA? Mostly or at both? the VA. Jerry Zelenok and I were there at that time. Uh, Mac Whitehouse was at, largely at the university. Jerry and I were largely at the VA. I had a research associate award, which protected half of my time for research mm -hmm. during those four years. And uh, so he and I would kind of rotate each week on the service and the other week in the lab. And it was a, uh, you know, the three, with the three of us there at the same age doing the same thing, it was an exciting, I mean, it was, it was, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> well, if you look at the co-authors on some of those papers, it's, uh, there's a long list of very good vascular surgeons that went through at the same time. That's right. Not just the ones you've mentioned. Uh, should we attribute that to uh, Dr. Stanley or Dr. Fry's tradition or just you fed off of each other? Well, I think it was a combination of all those things. I mean, you know, certainly uh, Jim Stanley inherited Bill Fry's tradition there, mm -hmm. and because uh, Bill left in, after a couple years in my residency, and then Jim became the chief. And uh, but Jim and Marty were, were leaders, and then there were many um, many residents who went into vascular surgery oh, yes. based on that tradition. And so it was a, a bit of a, a you know a club that developed there, and it, and it felt like you really had a a home uh, there in vascular surgery. And then you went to Dartmouth. Right, right. I, uh, I was sitting in a VA and of course you didn't really have a secretary at the VA and one day the phone rang and, and I said hello and they, it was me and they, they said this is Bob Critchlow from Dartmouth and um, you know we've been looking for a chief of vascular surgery and your name was suggested would you like to come out and look at the job? And I thanked him and said, sure, I, that sounded like a good idea. And then I hack on the phone and I said, where's Dartmouth? <laughs> <laughs> now, I knew it was in one of those small New England states, but, but being a Midwesterner at that time, I'd been to Boston, but nowhere north of. And to me, all those little states were jumbled up together. Uh, and, uh, but I went in, uh, out there to interview. And it, very interestingly, Dartmouth, uh, Hanover, is on the same latitude within about few minutes of Ludington, Michigan. If you draw a line and go across, there is Hanover. So, and it's a town of 10,000 people, which is the same size as the town I grew up in. It's a little bigger surrounding area. So I had found a town the same size as I grew up on the same latitude with a college. Um, and, um, and I saw um, there wasn't much vascular surgery being done, but there was a lot of cardiac surgery being done. And so 
two plus two, I realized that if we just hoisted the flag up and did a little work, that we could build a practice there. And um, so I, and and I think it was important for me at that stage in my career to be able to to um, do some things the way I wanted to do them and try to have try to try to grow something, try to develop something, try to make something happen. I, th I felt like I was ready to do that. And uh, so there, I was leaving a wonderful program and I had some misgivings, but at the same time I was excited about potentially um, launching it and bringing everything that I had learned at Michigan really uh, to Dartmouth and then letting that grow there. So that was, that was, that's the reason I did that. Well, you also brought from Michigan uh Dr. Walsh. That's right. Dr. Swalik. Well, and, and of course, uh, when, I, when I came there, uh, Martha McDaniel was there. She had been largely doing research and was at the VA. And the general surgeon who had been doing vascular had retired at the Hitchcock Hospital. So I started doing that and sort of on my own. And then uh, things got pretty busy pretty fast. And Rick Dow, who was a Michigan trained uh, general surgeon, excellent surgeon, was there at the VA. And I convinced him to come over and join me after a year to help out at the university hospital, which he did. And then two years later, which was my third year, he left to come back to Henry Ford. And that's when I recruited uh, Dan Walsh from Michigan, and who had done a year of training with Ed Garrett, like I had, and Bob Zolak from Michigan, who had done two years of training with Gene Strandness and Alec Clues. And they both came that summer. Uh, so then we had three. And now how many do you have? Now we have nine. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it gradually grew. Well, you've had a wonderful career, uh, and it's uh, not only been uh, just as a vascular surgeon developing Dartmouth, but you've done a lot of editing in your career. I have, Bill, and, it, and I've always uh, enjoyed writing. I enjoyed writing from when I was uh, in uh, High school. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was a, a good writer, and I enjoyed doing it. And I uh, and I enjoyed reading. I did a huge amount of reading of the literature when I was a resident. We would get these. We would go through these stacks of articles for Journal Club, and and it was just it became kind of a religion to always be reading the literature. And after you do that for a while, you get and you discuss them in a Journal Club fashion. You get sort of pretty good at analyzing them. So I was fortunate enough to be uh, selected first for the Association for Academic Surgery Program Committee, and then uh, the New England Vascular Program Committee, uh, and then later the SVS Program Committee. And, uh, and I calculated once that I thought for all these various meetings over all these years that I thought I had reviewed probably 5,000 abstracts, you know, that had been submitted. And, and as you know, you get this huge book of abstracts, and at that time we reviewed all of them. And you late at night, you're going through these, and you get pretty good at it. So I, um, I, uh, I, I was asked to join, uh, to do start doing reviews for the Journal of Vascular Surgery, which I enjoyed, and gradually did more, and gradually joined the editorial board, and then finally was uh, asked to be the editor. And I, um, I, I greatly enjoyed those years because it was such an opportunity to to be right in the thick of whatever was the latest development, to always read it before it even came out in print, and, uh, and to have some uh, input in helping people improve. Uh, and it's easy to reject a paper. Um, it's easy to accept a great paper. The, the, the opportunity for an editor is to improve the good paper. And, and that's where I think editors get satisfaction at the end of the day. Well, you were an editor for several years. Would you say that you reviewed half the papers that came through, or? Well, you know, Jim Seeger and I were co-editors yes. of the JVS, and, and we, we split them, although we did have a, an associate editor who would, who would cover when we were, quote, away. Uh, and so, and we had a basic science associate editor, uh, and we, we triaged some papers to them. So I would say that we reviewed um, a, between a third and a half, not, not fully a half of the papers. But that was still a large number because it, it, it dramatically increased during our tenure. And we started also to receive many, many more papers from abroad, yes. which were uh, all challenging in addition because sometimes they were a good paper, but that it was cloaked in an, in an English translation difficulty. And so that made it also hard because some reviewers are inclined to be uh, pretty abrupt with 
papers that aren't well written in English, and yet it might have been good science. Yes. So that was challenging also to sort that out. Would you attempt to send it back or to the author and say, would you please find somebody who will teach you English? <laughs> Well, we, 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 we tried all kind of different things, really. Inclu we tried that. We, we also tried, uh, in fact, Jimmy Yao helped us with this and a couple other people, senior people. We, we uh, had volunteer to help us edit some of these papers, uh, particularly if they were pe from people they knew. And so we sometimes would solicit help of external agents to help with the editing. You also edited a small textbook. <laughs> Rutherford's. I did. I, I uh, you know, I became involved as an associate editor a couple editions ago, and uh, when the uh, w when it became clear that Bob was going to transition away from this after six editions, you know, it, it, the man is a saint. It, you know, if anyone who's edited a textbook and and tried to coordinate that amount of information uh, realizes how how much work it is, and so. Uh, 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 Wayne Johnson had been involved a lot, and we had both talked with Bob about the transition, and we, we, we really suggested to him that he think about uh, involving the SVS in the future of the textbook, because what, what he really wanted to was ensure that it went forward, and he had come to Wayne and me and said, well, you guys take this over. And Wayne and I, thinking ahead of where we were in our career, said, well, we're not going to be able to do this for six editions, and we want to be sure that it goes forward. So. Let's think about getting the society involved as the editor and letting the society delegate the responsibilities to whom they choose with each upcoming edition. And he was very excited about that possibility and discussed that with the SVS leadership and that was the, that was the transition for the Rutherfords of Astor Surgery to sort of become an SVS publication. And I think it's a great model for sort of um, you know, allowing different individuals to become involved uh, at an appropriate pace over time and yet putting the uh, assurance of the society on the quality and the longevity of the piece. Well, it certainly does have a longevity, a life of its own, if you will. Right. It's wonderful. Uh, I've always admired people like you who could send a paper back to somebody like me and say, this is really a great paper, but... I mean, is that something that you, you think that, uh, uh, that it's just an eight in you, or you just developed reading 5,000 abstracts? <laughs> well, I, uh, I mean, I think most everything we accomplish is probably done through hard work more than innate talent. Uh, but um, I, I think two things. One is that to be a good editor, you know, you have to sort of divorce yourself first from any attachment to the authors. I mean, it's impossible for us not to know who the authors are, and we know most of them. But you, you have to detach oneself enough to know that they, and, and that they know that I'm, whatever I say here, it's not personal. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just the same thing I would say, no matter who wrote this. That's, that's step one. And then step two is to try to uh, pull back a bit and make sure that my thoughts are somehow grounded in science rather than just my thoughts. Because it's easy for editors to overstep their, their role and put too big an imprint on things. And at the same time, so there's a fine line between doing too much and doing too little. And I've, I've uh, heard it said that uh, Jim and I may have erred on the side of doing too much uh, in terms of you know, being sort of nitpicky and this, that, and the other thing. But we really, uh, Felt and I still believe it's important, and I think it's a sign of quality that that articles are well written, that they're put together well, that the that the abstract actually conveys the information for the readers who don't read the entire article. And so we spent a lot of time um, trying to make it work really well. And I think that the authors, even though they received a lot of red ink, appreciated that at the end of the um, time, hopefully, it was a better manuscript. Well, when you were president of the Vascular uh, Societies, the, there were two societies at that time, and somehow they merged. Right. right. Tell us about that. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to just digress briefly, Bill, because it, I want to go back to sort of how, uh, how I got started in, in SVS, because I was fortunate enough to become involved at a fairly young age, mm -hmm. and it started when there was an Association for Academic Surgery meeting in Seattle that I was going to. 
And I had read uh, a lot of work by Gene um, Strandness of what he was doing with ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And so I called him up before I came to Seattle, just cold called him, told him I was coming out there for this meeting, did he have a few minutes to meet with me? And he invited me to come over and showed me his lab, where at the time he was uh, putting together the duplex scanner. Mm -hmm. And he had this uh, assembled machinery with, with the, the B-mode imaging, and then he had it cl clamps and various things holding the Doppler on and all sort of equipment, a huge rack of electronic equipment, a couple engineers, Hokinson being one of them. And they were uh, just perfecting the very sort of beta version of a duplex scanner. And he showed me all this, and then he sat down and he talked to me for about an hour in his office and talked to me about vascular surgery, about academic surgery. I mean, he, he couldn't have been more uh, cordial and uh, really for a young person. I mean, I was so struck by that. So fast forward some number of years, I don't see Gene again, I mean, in person like that. And uh, one day I get a note from uh, the SDS that he had invited me to join the program committee. And we, we had no real association. And I say that because I think in a lot of societies there has been a tendency, uh, and there always is a natural tendency for us to invite people to participate whom we know. We may have worked with them or worked closely with them. We don't necessarily look to say, well, who published the most papers last year? Let's put them on this program committee or some logical method of selection, right? So. So, so Gene really reached out and gave me a chance to be on a program committee and at the time Norm Hertzer was the secretary and John Porter was the recorder. Hmm. And let me tell you, those were interesting meetings because Norm Hertzer was, uh, I mean, one of the brightest people I've met and he was, uh, he, he knew the literature well and he was an you know, outstanding surgeon and he could immediately sniff something out if it wasn't right. And John Porter was so opinionated, also one of the smartest people I've ever met, and a huge command of the literature. And so uh, it was pretty interesting for me to, to discover with John that um, you know, if I had a different opinion, I would, I said what my opinion was and why, and, and he'd sort of huff and puff and blow up a little bit and get more out of me, and I would say it, and then he would sort of back off and say, okay, well, that one's in or that one's out. And so I, I really learned that uh, if you if you said what what you thought and you had some basis for it, that even with you know these really uh, high level people, uh, you could be effective, and um, so that gave me my start. And then, uh, or based on being on that program committee for a number of years, I think it was five years at that time, five or six. Uh, then I was uh, nominated to be recorder, which at the time was sort of associated with the program, and I was recorder for five or six years, a long time, uh, uh, before I was um, nominated to be president. And, it, and so the, the point of all that was that I had a lot of time on the SVS Council mm -hmm. and the Joint Council for, for, for over 10 years, 12 years I think, maybe more. And, um, and I think over that time appreciated that uh, from an outsider's perspective, looking at this, these were two societies that although they were organized for, by slightly different people for theoretically slightly different reasons, they were really uh, indistinguishable. And, um, and yet there were efficiencies that weren't able to be met because of these, these two structures. And um, you know, vascular surgery was approaching a time when we looked around at other disciplines like orthopedics, who had become extremely successful by turning their annual meeting into uh, a business organization that was advocating orthopedics. Um, so Tom Riles uh, on the AAVS side had been through a, a sort of a very similar trajectory as I had uh, involved in the AAVS council. And the two of us would we'd be at the joint council meeting and we'd sit next to each other and sometimes one of us would roll their eyes or, and we could both tell that we were a little bit frustrated with some, some of the, because everybody tends to want to be to advocate their idea and then take credit for their idea and um, sort of protect it. And that made for collaboration to sometimes be difficult, even though it should have been easy because we were all advocating for the same thing. And uh, so we were, the year we were elected, uh, the, which would be in the year before, you know, when we, right when we were taking 
office, we sat down, we had a little back corner meeting at one of the hotels where the meeting was, and we said, what do you think we should try to do this year? And um, we said, well, you know, it'd be really great to merge these two societies. And we both said, boy, that's going to be a tough one. But it would be great because we could eliminate all this dupl duplication. And we knew there would be pushback. And, and, and people being people, you know, pushback was the first couple comments we heard, like, well, there will only be half the number of presidents. I mean, these, these are important academic positions that people, is, people aspire to. And, 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 and so that, that's a legitimate concern, even though it sounds a little superficial. But we don't have a lot of ways to recognize people. That's one of them. Uh, and then we also were, had the concern around the fact that the, the society was really the annual meeting. And there wasn't a lot of structure outside of that. Our organizers, we had a wonderful you know, organizational group, but they were really a meeting organizational group. They weren't a sort of a, a business office. And then, of course, they were based in Massachusetts, and a lot of the stuff was going on in Chicago, mainly the American College. So we talked about it somewhere, we thought about it, and we decided to put together this three-part plan. I'll come back to that. We decided we were going to try to merge the SVS and the AAVS. We were going to find uh, an executive director and create a separate business group and pull away from our meeting management group and establish offices in Chicago in one year. And many people told us that this was uh, impossible and suggested that we just pick one or two of those things. And much like an omnibus bill going through Congress, we felt that if we kept these three things together, there were certain constituencies that really wanted the societies merged, many that didn't. There were other constituencies that really wanted to pull away from this meeting management group and have our own business operation. And there were some who thought we should move to Chicago with it. So, so different constituencies. So we felt that if we kept these things bundled, we'd be more likely to get overall support. And so we convened a process of probably at least a half a dozen meetings. We invited people from both of the societies, advocates and the strong opponents, to come to the table and start having a dialogue about how we could do this. And we, we brought forward ideas that would allow many people to continue to participate. So we created the council structure, the clinical council, the research council, uh, it, it within the society so that chairs of council would have a role equivalent to officers so that we would continue to allow opportunities for people to be involved. And of course one of the big, uh, the big uh, issues was the, the sort of the uh, honor, if you will, of being associated with the SVS, you know, the, the academic small society, and yet the reality that in order to influence Congress and other societies, other specialties, we needed to have numbers. We needed to have the more numbers, the more influence. So we had the issue around the SVS and the honorific, and we decided, and we talked to a bunch of people, and um, we came up with the concept of creating the distinguished fellow nomenclature to recognize what had been academic productivity and to, and to really allow, um, I, say, I would say more of the senior people in the SVS than the junior people to uh, embrace this concept and not feel like what they had uh, experienced and what they had devoted a lot of their time to would somehow be eliminated. And so that the fears that people had would be that something they thought was really important or attached to might somehow go away in this process. So we tried to, to create more opportunities for people to participate even though there would be fewer officers. We transitioned all the existing officers over a period of time created a more open process for all the committee appointments and whatnot. And, uh, and at the same time, we started looking for office space and uh, we started uh, interviewing various people, including Rebecca Marin. And we had a, a group that did that and we had hired a headhunter who had worked with the orthopedic group and so brought a lot of knowledge to us about how orthopedics had been so successful in doing this. We had several people that helped us in, in those searches and we and we also started direct negotiation with the college about the potential because they had built out space in this building that they didn't need and they were able to offer it to us at a competitive, attractive value. And um, so finally the Joint Council uh, agreed in, in the spring to sort of 
vote and approve this. It wasn't unanimous. But it was ultimately going to be left up to the, um, the membership. And it was a little bit unfortunate at the time because there were other things going on at that time, largely the, the, the issue of concern around the American Board of Surgery and the American Board of Vascular Surgery, which had, uh, had uh, somewhat of a polarizing effect uh, in, this, in the specialty. And, and some people um, somehow attached this um, merger uh, toward one of those and that became a little more polarizing. So we weren't, you know, we weren't 100 percent sure until the vote of the membership. And and Tom and I talked about it and decided that we really had to put out all the facts and make sure everybody understood what we thought were compelling reasons to do this. And so we we we, we fl didn't flip a coin, but because my talk was right before the vote, I I was the one who was going to give it, and that's why my address was about that. And as uh, it happened, it was overwhelmingly adopted, and looking back on it, I think both Tom and I feel that it was probably the, the most important thing we could contribute by helping shepherd this through, because if you look at SDS now, and what a, what a remarkable business it has become, and how it's been able to advocate extraordinarily well uh, in Washington for vascular surgery, how it's involved many more volunteers in all of its committees and infrastructure, and how well this office has worked, and how well it's done financially. Those were all the things that we had hoped for uh, or dreamed about. And I think, um, you know, sort of looking back, it's, it's, it's been amazing. Well, let me use your words to segue then into the American Board of Surgery. <laughs> you've, uh, you've been very active uh, both uh, with the board and with uh, the vascular review. Uh, how, did, how did you... Uh, get through all of that in the midst of the controversy that you alluded to. Some of our brethren wanted to separate away from the board, others wanted to stay, and how did that all work out? Well, they, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a very complicated story, and, um, and it, it's a little hard to know where to start, but I, the, an important bit of background for me is that I had been uh, asked to join the Residency Review Committee for Surgery. and. Um, and I accepted that position, and, and I was on the RRC, and of course at that time, I mean, that was right around the time that these questions came up, and I was one of the original signees of the declaration in the Journal of Vascular Surgery that we needed a separate board, because at that time, the American Board of Surgery was being quite intransigent about the question of whether vascular surgeons could be trained independently of general surgeons. From my perspective, it was always about training. Uh, I, I didn't really care, and I don't think any of us particularly care, what the name of the board is that's on our certificate. We just want to know how we can get there, and do we have to get there through general surgery? That was the question. And so, so for a long time, I was an advocate and met with, uh, I remember meeting with Jim Stanley, Frank Veith, and, and the American Board of Surgery, and I was there on the RRC advocating for the concept that we didn't need to have full general surgery training in order to become a vascular surgeon, that it was inefficient. And that in the long run, given the changing demographic of the applicants that we were seeing, we were, uh, it was not a sustainable model, and that we needed to be more efficient and more focused. And we couldn't just keep expanding training every time a new procedure came along, which is effectively what we did for endovascular procedures, and still think that these people needed to know how to do breast surgery. I mean, that was it in a nutshell. And, and uh, so th that, uh, you know, everyone had slightly different perspectives about that, and some people had more of a, a, a solution through a separate board and saw that as the best way forward. Other people, I think, believe that there were a lot of advantages of, in being part of a larger board because there are a lot of political decisions that get made at the Board of Medical Specialists, and most of them depend on, you know, how big your boat is. So there were many people who felt that it would be better if we could do this within the ABS structure. And, and so this argument raged, and the ABS was not being very helpful during those early years. And then um, at, at some point, uh, Dick Green, it was in my, after I was president, Dick Green, who was, had just become president, and I met with uh, Frank Lewis and uh, Bob Rhodes, and we had a really good discussion about where this was going and the fact that you know, somebody was going to have to give a little bit. 
and and and, and once it became came clear, it's interesting. There were there in, in many, as is often the case, there were misunderstandings <laughs> from both sides about the position of the others. So when we had a chance to sit down, sort of for a long meeting, and thrash this out a bit, just a small group. It became clear that they were more attached to keeping vascular surgery in the fold of the American Board of Surgery, just as they wish they had done with thoracic surgery, than they were whether you had to do general surgery first. And so the solution that we came to in that meeting was that they would issue a statement that they would support, uh, a, at that time called sub-board, that would be based on the concept that preliminary training in general surgery would not be a prerequisite. Now at the same time, I had been for years, going back to Bob Barnes <laughs> and your connection, and, um, and others uh, who had long advocated for early differentiation in surgical training, core surgery followed by specialty surgery. I had had many meetings with the uh, Association of Program Directors in Surgery. I'd been, at the time, I was the president of the Program Directors in Vascular Surgery and was on the RRC. So I had a lot, so I was involved in a lot of meetings and we tried, and we were coming up with curricula for training vascular surgeons, the best possible curriculum. And, uh, and we developed the five year training program. And a lot of people said, well, you can't train a vascular surgeon in five years. And we said, well, you can train a general surgeon in five years, can't you? Yes, and well, isn't that a broader knowledge-based discipline than vascular surgery, which is quite focused? Yes, and it just took many of the more senior people in general surgery a while to sort of, for the light to go on. Say, oh yeah, gee, I guess if I thought of it that way, maybe you could train a vascular surgeon in five years. And once the uh, American Board of Surgery agreed and saw that concept, then it became much simpler. Then it became just a pragmatic approach. What's the easiest way to get this done? And the easiest way was to form a vascular surgery board within the ABS rather than the tumultuous battle to have it be separate because at the end we accomplished everything we wanted to accomplish. Now are your trainees currently two years of general surgery, three of vascular, three, two? How is well, we, we actually, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's a natural experiment going on. Yes. We started uh, and had the first program approved, and the only reason for that was I'd been on the RRC. I had written the program requirements. I had a leg up, if you will. And I remember saying at the June vascular meeting, the SVS meeting that year, standing up, there was a paper about some, and I stood up and I said that, that uh, there will soon be an approved uh, five-year program that this is going to happen, and we sent in an application, and two weeks later it was approved. And Michigan and Pitt came on that year. There were three programs that first year. And Pitt decided, uh, Mac Macaroon decided that they would do core surgery, as they call it, first for two years and then three years of vascular surgery. We decided that we would do six months of core surgery and six months of vascular each year for the first four years because we really wanted to be sure that these young people knew that they were going to be vascular surgeons and have a home. And we also felt that their experience in general surgery as a chief resident at the fourth year would be better in terms of the complex mm -hmm. abdominal procedures. So we wanted to spread it out more, which is how we're continuing to do it. And, but across the country now in all the programs, there's quite a mix. And I suspect there will be a convergence in time as we begin to evaluate the products is our first resident be, uh, will be finishing next year. that would be chief resident this year for us. And um, then we'll start to see how this is all working. But my impression so far is that it's going to be uh, very successful. These people are immersed in uh, vascular training from day one. Um, and I'll never forget the first year that we were interviewing candidates. And of course, it, hardly anyone knew about these programs mm -hmm. then. And so I would interview them, how did you find out about this and why aren't you interested in doing the traditional five and two program? Why, why aren't you interested? And this uh, one young man was sitting there and he said to me, because I don't want to wait. I said, bingo. Well, at Dartmouth you have another, uh, another uh, uh, hat to wear and that you're within the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practices rather famous place. Right. Uh, what are you doing there? 
Well, you know, I, to be honest, I'm, I've been peripherally involved with that. I've, I've gotten support from some of the, the uh, epidemiologists and statisticians and just thinkers at, at the Dartmouth Institute. Uh, they, uh, they really helped me put together the Dartmouth Atlas of Vascular Healthcare, which was really the first geographically based analysis of vascular procedures. And, and they've, uh, they've trained several of our junior faculty in, the ma in their master's program to develop really outstanding outcomes-based research profiles. So they are uh, really a, a, a campus-wide uh, resource uh, in outcomes research for, for all of us. And I've, they asked me to join the faculty a few years ago when, when I went after we had done quite a bit of work together. So um, uh, my principal work is still there as a surgeon, but I, I managed to uh, continue to do outcomes research. And I think that the, the basis for uh, my being involved with them really was that uh, back in 2001, when we launched the Vascular Study Group of New England, uh, northern New England at yes. the time, and that was, uh, as you know, uh, there had been a very successful effort by cardiac surgeons in northern New England, just this, this Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, uh, eight or nine hospitals, and they had started collecting data in the mid-80s. Uh, every, all the cardiac surgeons were concerned at the time because uh, public publication, the New York Times was published in the mortality rates of cabbage. And of course, <laughs> every surgeon who looked at that, well, my patients are sicker. <laughs> and my results aren't as bad as they look. Well, they decided that they not only wanted to keep track of their results, but to improve them across the region. So they started meeting twice a year and benchmarking themselves and talking about the little granular details about how they did things and trying to figure out what worked best. And uh, 10 years later, they had reduced the cabbage mortality rate by 25% across the region. It was a phenomenal, uh, important observation and result. And so, so we, because they had started this in northern New England, we and a lot of the other surgeons knew about it, we were pretty easily able to attract some interest among vascular surgeons in this almost the same hospitals, a few additional ones, to try to duplicate this effort. And so we spent about two years uh, designed, figuring out what we wanted to collect and how we wanted to do it. And one of the first big decisions we made that was, in retrospect, really important is we said, uh, we have to have more than in-hospital results, which was what they had. I mean, if you do a cabbage and you basically, if you live or die, you're sort of done with that. If you're doing a prophylactic carotid in an asymptomatic patient and you only have in-hospital results, what have you learned? Uh, so we felt we needed one-year results and the surgeons committed to collecting that when the patient came back in the office. We were using paper forms. Um, we started collecting data officially, I and mean, we started a little pilot study in 2002, but in January 2003, we started collecting data. And uh, we had spent two years designing the form. We had over 120 variables that we had collected for each procedure. So we collected all the preoperative variables that people needed to do potential risk adjustment in the future, all the intraoperative details that, of course, every surgeon was convinced mattered, and then the, uh, the outcomes, and then the one year follow up. And um, it, it continued to grow. The first year we had uh, 500 procedures to analyze uh, and uh, up for discussion was should we continue to meet. <laughs> and, uh, but every uh, institution, um, every, every group that was involved continued to be involved and continued to come to the meeting, volunteer their time, enter the data at their own cost. We had gotten a grant from CMS, a, a self-limited grant for five years to get this started, to do the central, to receive the paper forms and key punch them and get them in the computer and all that sort of thing. And after five years, when the funding expired, we went to the hospitals that were participating. By then, we had had enough data to show them some interesting things, and all of them agreed to split the costs and to continue it. So we've now, we've now grown that to 30 institutions in all six New England states. And it, it, it's important because the, these uh, semi-annual regional meetings are critical, I think, in cementing the group and, and making things happen. And so, because the, the key question is, how do you translate data into practice change? Because there have been a lot of registries, there are a lot of registries, there are a lot of national registries, but how does that get translated into practice change? And we do it by discussing the data and talking about how different people do it and having granular discussions and then, give, and then agreeing that this is probably the best way to do it and then give people a benchmark. And everybody wants to get better. You know, you, you, 
you uh, may not know this, Bill, but surgeons are competitive people. <laughs> It's good news. It's good news. <laughs> and, uh, and if you just give them a, a report card that shows that they're not, maybe they don't have the best statin use in their patients, or their patients aren't getting beta blockers, or they're not patching their conventional carotid endarterectomy, or they're not controlling their diabetes tightly, or whatever it is, the outcome measure, they want to get better. And what they, what they like to be told is, and, and the minute they say that, the minute there's a bar graph and I'm down here and I want to get up here, the minute I say, well, I know I'm going to get better, then I've taken ownership of that. And physicians uh, like to take ownership and they like to figure out how to make it work. They don't particularly like to be told how to do it. And so what we do is we provide benchmarking about the key quality measures and we let the surgeons and now physicians, because we have cardiologists and radiologists involved, uh, figure out how to improve, and we've shown a, a number of examples of improvement across the region. And when Jeb Hallett left uh, Bangor, Maine to go to Charleston, having been a member of this, he started it down in South Carolina. Hmm. And that was, uh, and the first paper we wrote about this, we, we waited several years until we thought we had everything right. In 2007, we published our first paper. And I got a call that month from a surgeon in Washington State said, can I join? And we said, well, you know, our model is going to these regional meetings and how we get together, and it's not just a registry. We just use the registry as a tool, but stay tuned. And uh, so Jeb wanted to do this, and then uh, we started talking, other people started to talk about it, and then as a result of all that, last year the SVS, you know, as you know, took this over, launched the Vascular Quality Initiative, and now we have eight regional groups that are accredited. We have a patient safety organization that um, uh, acts as an umbrella to protect the security and the safety of the information and allows, allows us to submit patient identified information under the Patient Safety Act without informed consent or IRB approval. That allows us then to link the data with things like the Social Security Death Index and soon Medicare claims so we can really look at long-term events. And um, now we have over 160 hospitals in the U.S., almost 1,000 physicians uh, participating. We're accumulating uh, 3,000 procedures per month. Can you imagine the power of this? I remember when Norm Hertzer gave his presidential address and said, you know, we really have to measure things. Data is everything. And now the SVS has it. We have 50,000 procedures in this database. All of this is fascinating, and I agree that we need these numbers, but some of my right-wing colleagues will say, well, doesn't this kind of lead to government control and what and how, what's the role of government using all of this data that we have? Well, it's interesting. I, I was at, uh, yesterday, I was at a meeting at the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality, HRQ, which uh, oversees patient safety organizations, and also at a meeting with the Quality Measures Group of CMS, mm -hmm. who, who are proponents of public reporting. So I, I met with these two groups, and as, as you know, the Patient Safety Act precludes us from publishing identified data, identified by patient or provider or center. So, so the data that we collect are, cannot legally be used for public reporting. There's no way, it's a civil and, and criminal penalty for doing so. So it can't be used for that. And so that's what, and so the Patient Safety Act was designed to allow providers to f report bad outcomes without fear of reprisal. It cannot be used even for quality assurance. It can't be used for determining privileges or anything like that. All right. It can only be used for quality improvement. So it was a perfect model for us. But now, uh, there, as you imply, there are strong pressures uh, for public reporting of outcomes. And the concern, I think the professional concern around that is not that we sh the patients don't deserve to know our uh, true outcomes, but that the outcomes that will be published will not be accurate, will not be risk-adjusted, will not reflect what we really do. I think that's the fear that people have. And so um, uh, if, if you go under the assumption that some um, score outcome is going to be reported, then the question really is, well, whose data would you like to use? I mean, would you like to use the claims data based on how the coders in the basement put in your, interpret your chart? Or would you like to use data that, that you and your team have some purview over that you can check and validate? And I think obviously it's the latter. 
And so one of our discussions yesterday with AHRQ and CMS was, how can we merge these? Can, can we have voluntary physician disclosure of their results without identifying patients based on PSO data? Or if not, we can work around it and have the data submitted to two different places, and we can technically, we can technically get around that. Because, Bill, I, th I think that we will um, need in the future to uh, public re report outcomes. I think they have to be carefully uh, analyzed, risk-adjusted, and, and tabulated. But, and I would rather be in charge of doing that than have someone else be in charge. Well, that makes sense. Uh, now, you, uh, you did one other thing or a couple of other things in, in terms of risk. You were part of the VA study for aneurysms. And you're in a RAND panel for aneurysms. Right, and a RAND panel for carotids. Yeah. It, it was uh, interesting. It was my first uh, insight when we had the uh, panel on, uh, the, it was the appropriateness of carotid endarterectomy. Mm -hmm. so it was the first perspective that I had about how different specialists could look at the same information and interpret it very differently. And um, how different specialties brought obvious biases to the table, including surgeons. Uh, and at the end result of it, I, I was not confident that the uh, Delphi method, if you will, uh, was any kind of an adjudicator or balance of all of these varied opinions. So I, I wasn't, I, I felt that what came out was kind of a middle of the road document that didn't, didn't really please anyone and I, and I didn't think it was too helpful. So it was, uh, it was a little bit discouraging, although I think um, the, the spirit was, was appropriate. I mean, it was, it was well-intentioned. I'm not sure it worked as well as we would like. How about the VA study? You were well, I was only involved in that in the, uh, in the planning stages. We, you know, our VA is somewhat smaller, and we weren't ultimately selected to be a part of the uh, treatment part of the trial. I was involved in the planning phase, and I, uh, they had a great group of people that went on to conduct that study, and you know, they're still uh, collecting good data from it. So it's, I think that was very useful. What's in your future currently? <laughs> well, I'm in. I'm, um, you know, I'm really enjoying still my clinical practice. Although I'm only practicing three days a week, I'm spending two days a week now working on the Vascular Quality Initiative, and um, I've been, uh, I've been, well, not amazed. I've been um, gratified to see how enthusiastic vascular surgeons are about participating in this quality initiative, and how thirsty they are to be able to have, to see their results and to compare themselves with others and to see how they're doing. And, and now we're starting to see, uh, you know, a little bit of friendly competition, and not only within regions, but between regions. Uh, you know, the New York City uh, Vascular Study Group of Greater New York just organized, I was down there last week, and someone made a comment that, you know, in two years we're gonna have more patients in our New York registry than you do in New England, and I said, Bring it on. That's exactly what we want. You know, we want a little interregional competition, and we want people to look and say, geez, these guys use statins a lot more than I do, or, boy, they control the heart rate in the operating room in that region a lot better than we do in ours. What can we learn from them? How can we, how can we make? And so with, with these kind of comparisons, all of a sudden, there are millions of interesting questions that open up. And at the, um, at the SVS meeting next week, there are nine presentations that are based on VSGNE data, and they all involve thousands of patients, which would have been unheard of 10 years ago. And now it's uh, electronically available. It's a great resource for our trainees mm -hmm. to be able to use that uh, data bank, if you will, to answer questions. And I think it's a great resource for our specialty. And I think it really does uh, put us in a leadership role uh, in quality in vascular treatment. And, and um, that's certainly where we want to be, uh, you know, going forward. Personally, what are you going to be doing in five years? <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I think I'm still going to be working in VQI. I, I may or may not be practicing, to be honest. Uh, I certainly wanted to see our five-year fellowship, I mean, residency through its first fellow, mm -hmm. and I've enjoyed being a part of that. Uh, I, uh, I really enjoy working with my group of colleagues at Dartmouth, and I, I'm, I'm, so I'm not anxious to do too much different, but I'm, uh, I took up golf three years ago, I did, yeah. <laughs> and I, I must say I have loved it, and I have, uh, 
I've tried to get better, and after an initially good learning curve, I've sort of stabilized. <laughs> I find consistency to be elusive. <laughs> um, but I enjoy the game on many aspects, and, um, and I continue to do things like run and ride my bicycle and do kayaking. My wife and I built a new house last year on a little lake near where we lived and uh, that was a fascinating venture because I'd never had a house built before and we really enjoyed that process and we are uh, filling our lives with um, good close friends in the area and uh, family and uh, and really I think learning as probably all the younger people learned a long time ago that uh, every minute counts and uh, <laughs> doing my best to enjoy every minute of it. Well. Now your daughters are living around, or are they? Scared? Well, my um, my younger daughter Molly is, uh, who is an art historian and artist, and now a photographer, professional photographer, is living in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, with her husband and her two daughters. And so I go visit my granddaughters as often as I can. I wish they lived closer. And my older daughter Sarah has just moved uh, back uh, from the U.S. She uh, she is has been a business person after getting a Ph.D. in physics at Stanford. She joined McKinsey and was a business consultant and then formed a high-tech investment company in Abu Dhabi where she spent two years, then a year in Germany with this chip manufacturing company, Global Foundry, and has now just uh, joined their new, brand new uh, facility in, outside Saratoga Springs, New York, uh, to the uh, biggest private construction project in the U.S., making computer chips. And uh, so she's two hours from home and I'm delighted. Be sounds spending good. more time with her. Sounds great. Anything else you'd like to t to bring up at this time? I think we've we've covered it pretty well, Bill, and I appreciate uh, your taking the time. And Jimmy, it's appreciate your putting this together. I, uh, I it'll be great. I hope I have a chance to, in 20 years to look back on it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.